Britain faces the lowest growth of any OECD nation over the next two years. Why? Mr Speaker, Mr Speaker, this country has experienced since 2010 the third highest growth in the G7. This, this year, the fastest growth in the G7 and unemployment at a multi-decade low. We're getting on to deliver more growth, Mr Speaker. We're delivering free ports. We're investing in apprenticeships. We're protecting R&D. And if the Labour Party is serious about actually supporting growth, maybe they should get on the phone with their union paymasters and tell them to call off the strike. He's in total denial. We're bottom of the 38 OECD countries who are all in the same boat when it comes to COVID and Ukraine. And he wants a pat on the back. It's like a football manager, bottom of the league at Christmas, celebrating a away draw three months ago, and it won't wash. So let's, they don't like their record, that's the problem. So let's try it another way. Why is Britain set to be the first country into recession and the last country out? Yeah. Mr Speaker, I'm pleased that the Right Honourable Gentleman brought up the OECD report, because it contained actually three very important points. Firstly, it made the point that actually in the years following the pandemic, we're projected to have almost the highest growth amongst our peer countries. And it, it, also, it, it, also, it also made the point it was crystal clear that the challenges we face are completely international in nature. And thirdly, and thirdly, and thirdly, it, it, thirdly, Mr. Speaker, it supported our fiscal plan because it's credible and ensures sustainability. Now, the right honourable gentleman would have known all of that if he actually read the whole report. But, but he's not. He's not. He's not interested in substance. He's an opportunist, Mr. Speaker. In, in, in four weeks, Mr. Speaker. In, in, four, in four weeks, in four weeks, I've, in four weeks, I've strengthened the economy. We've put more money into the NHS and schools. We've delivered a deal. We've delivered a deal to tackle illegal migration. In the same four weeks, in the same four weeks, all we've. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, Prime Minister, when I stand, you've got to sit down. But can I just say to you, you came to me quite rightly and said to me, we want to get through Prime Minister's questions. I'm going to give short answers. Please stick to what you have. Well, Mr Speaker, there's only, there's only one party that's crashed the economy and they're sitting there. And I noticed this, Mr Speaker. I noticed this. He won't say why Britain is set to be the first into a recession and the last out. So I will. Twelve years of Tory failure followed by 12 weeks of Tory chaos. For a decade, they've let our economy drift aimlessly before suddenly cutting the parachute ropes and slamming it to the ground. And because of the changes he's made, a typical household will end up with tax increases of £1,400. They don't want to hear about these tax increases of £1,400. Contrast that. Contrast that to a super wealthy non dom living here but holding their income overseas. How much more. All order. Mr. Young, I don't need any more. I don't need shouting, don't need pointing. You're meant to be a good example when you sit on this front bench because you're the second. Don't spoil what you're meant to do. Just that Mr. Speaker, I don't think they want to hear this. Because of the changes. Because of the changes he's made, a typical household will end up paying tax increases of £1,400. Contrast that to a super wealthy non-dom living here but holding their income overseas. How much more has he asked them to pay? Oh, 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 just order. As I said to the Prime Minister, I said to the Leader of the Opposition, I've got to get through this list. I need you both to help me and think of other members. Come on. Well, Mr Speaker, Labour had 13 years to address this issue and did nothing, nothing. It was the Conservative government that took action and tightened the rules. But the problem, the problem with his idea, the problem with his idea is that it would end up costing Britain money. 
not 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 my words not my words the words of the former labor shadow chancellor but ra- rather than peddling fairy tales and gesture politics let's actually tell him what we're doing to deliver for this country a record increase in the national living wage protecting millions from energy bills protecting the pensioners triple lock that's what we're doing for this country Mr Speaker, if they had grown the economy at the same rate as the last Labour government, we'd have tens of billions of pounds more to spend on that. Oh, Mr Speaker, it wasn't a trick question. The answer is, he's not asked non-DOMs to pay a penny more. Every year, he talks about the money, every year that's £3.6 billion thrown away because he won't make them pay their taxes here. Mr Speaker, every time he opens his mouth, another powerful business voice says he hasn't got a plan on growth. The failure of the last 12 years and the chaos of the last 12 weeks are compounded by the decisions he's taking now. He won't follow Labour's plan to scrap non-DOM status. Instead, we've got an NHS staffing crisis. He won't follow Labour's plan to make oil and gas giants pay their fair share. Instead, he hammers working people. And he won't push through planning reform. Instead, he kills off the dream of home ownership. Too weak to take on his party. Too weak to take on vested interest. Twelve long years of Tory government. Five prime ministers, seven chancellors. Why do they always clobber working people? Mr Speaker, he talks about leadership. This summer, I stood on my principles and told the country what they needed to hear, even though it was difficult. When he ran for leader, he told his party what they wanted to hear. And even now, even now, he says one thing and he does the other. He says he cares for working people, but he won't stand up to the unions. He said he... He said he'd honour Brexit, but he tried to have a second referendum. And now he tries to talk tough about immigration, but he promised to defend free movement. You can trust him, you can trust him to deliver for his party. You can trust me to deliver for the country. Mr Speaker, it is right that we respect the decision of the court. But the Prime Minister can't claim to respect the rule of law and then deny democracy in the very same breath. If democracy is to matter, if elections matter, then mandates matter. Since 2014, the Scottish National Party has won eight elections in a row. Last year, we won a landslide. The Scottish Parliament now has the biggest majority for an independence referendum in the history of devolution. The Prime Minister doesn't even have a personal mandate to sit in 10 Downing Street. What right does a man with no mandate have to deny Scottish democracy? Mr Speaker, when when it comes to Scottish democracy, I'm pleased that the Scottish Government has one of the most powerful devolved assemblies anywhere in the world. And and I'm pleased, and, and and I was pleased, very shortly after becoming Prime Minister, to be the first Prime Minister in over a decade to attend the Council, to sit down with the First Minister, to explore ways in which we can work together with the Scottish Government to deliver for the people of Scotland. Whether that's delivering our growth deals, delivering free ports, or ensuring that the £1.5 billion of extra Barnet money can go towards supporting public services, that's what we're committed to doing in Scotland.